Gentlemen, my name is Gareth Newham and I head the Justice and Violence Prevention Program here at the ISS in Pretoria. Welcome to today's seminar on how corruption erodes Africa's wealth and governance prospects. Um, very happy uh, to be launching two papers that we were, as the result of a, a project that was funded by CEDA, the Swedish International Development Agency, based in Addis, looking at particularly issues of corruption in the extractive industry in Africa and issues of party political funding in Africa as well. So we will be talking or focusing specifically on those two issues today. Um, we have three speakers. Uh, as you can see, uh, we were expecting to have Judith February. Unfortunately, she contacted me yesterday afternoon with laryngitis. So uh, she is not able to be here today to present, but I'll present um, a bit of our work tracking how state capture has undermined public safety and the functioning of the criminal justice system and then some of the work that's going on in terms of party political funding. So some of the work in your paper and some of the more recent developments in, in the South Africa legislation on that. So both papers are available. Please help, help yourself outside to the papers. These and others are freely available for you to take with you um, and distribute. Um, we will start off with Professor Annie Barbara Chikwana from the University of Johannesburg, and she will talk about the work she did on extractive industry corruption in Africa. Then I will be speaking, talking a bit about, as I said, the criminal justice, state capture, and party political funding. And then we will have Liesl Lowe Vaudren, who will talk a bit about the African Union's uh, Year of Tackling Corruption 2018 and some of the big initiatives around that. So that'll kind of give you the span of the work that all the issues we'll be talking about today. And after the presentations, we will then uh, open up for discussion, comments, and inputs from the floor. Um, we also have an online audience. So when we are talking here, and at the podium, we'll always have our speakers on so they can hear. Um, please fill in the evaluation forms on your seats and just leave them there. We do value, uh, value your feedback about our events. And of course, we want to thank the uh, CEDA for funding this project, these publications and this event and we also are grateful to the support we receive from the members of the ISS Partnership Forum which include the governments of Australia, Canada, Denmark, Finland, Ireland, Japan, Netherlands, Norway, Sweden and the USA and the Hans Seidel Foundation. So without further ado I'll hand over to Annie to take us through a bit about issues to do with corruption in Africa and the extractive industry. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you, Gareth, for everything, the opportunity to work on this project and to look at rather what is not happening, not your question, what is happening. Because when you look at the scale and the problems and the challenges, for me, it's more of what is not happening because a lot of you know initiatives are on the ground, but still, we don't seem to be closing that gap. So for me, it's really a question of what is not happening. And because I've happened to be working on some governance work um, with three large networks, combating corruption and um, uh, you know, crime in the region, it has become even clearer that the, what is missing you know, is connectivity amongst different entities that are working out there, and also communication. And I think if we can get those two things together, then perhaps the many initiatives can become connected for greater impacts. Now, this paper uses a definition that straddles both divides the public and the private. We, we all know that there is a tendency to just point out on public corruption by public officials, and we forget the other side, you know, the supply side. The demands is clearly, you know, shown so where it comes from, but we always don't pay attention to the supply side. And when you look at the extractive sector, that's where you actually see this glaring divide and the challenges as well in there. And so, what this definition that I'm using here, the circumvention of formally agreed or implicit rules for decision making in both public and private sectors, or the use of personal inducements to achieve institutional and or personal objectives. I, I, I think this, this doesn't 
you know, point out one side only is perhaps being the faulty side, although we expect a lot more from government because they are not a for-profit for entity and, of course, have to safeguard the welfare of the citizens. Now, what is the scope of corruption? This, I think you already know. You have seen a lot of, you know, information already with regard to the scale of corruption. It's in figures, it's in charts. You, you, the UN, UNECA, in Addis Ababa, they've done a lot of work on this already. But we don't seem to be able to put that information together to just get a very clear picture of what exactly this means. Because if we look at the figures, we need to also look at what is happening on the ground. How do we relate the quality of life of citizens? How do we relate not even the quality of services, but just the capability to have those services there and to this gap between what we lose in terms of our failure as Africans in particular to upgrade our management skills and control you know, uh, the whole uh, corporate um, side, especially in the extractive sector, you know, it's, it's just a very complicated, sophisticated, you know, system that we have not bothered to invest time in learning. It's a very fragmented approach that we have taken across all the countries, which is why I look at the problems as being a challenge in state capacity rather than just, you know, it's just corruption because we are prone to corruption, whether by our DNA or by, you know, some other reason. It's really about that scope that we are not putting together. We, we are not looking, you know, if we look at it in a, in a kaleidoscopic fashion and turn it upside, you can see, you see the glamorous world there. You see who's pulling the strings there, who gets pulled up, who gets pulled down, who is trying. We know artisanal mining, for instance, has been there since the beginning of time, you know, and Africans have been doing it for a long time. But when you look at other developments in that kaleidoscope there, you enter, you throw in the Chinese, you throw in everybody else who has interest, then it becomes really messy. But the scope and incidence of corruption in the African region is not something that we can dispute. And a, a, an important fact to point out here is that the OECD studies have demonstrated, you know, you know, that at most 20% of bribery cases that they have noted in their research are involving the extractive industry. Africa loses 148 billion annually to corruption, and I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. When you look at the way these figures are contested, you know, by the different um, entities, by the different governments, you know, by different groups conducting research, a lot of it, of course, going out through illicit financial flows, and this is at most 6% or around 6% of the GDP, and many countries don't even allocate 6% to health or to education you'll find that maybe that 6% you get it in the army or you know, to the military or wherever, but health, fine 3%, 4%, and already that begins to show you, you know, the challenges in um, state capacity. I have many examples here of how much each country is estimated to have lost, but still these figures are all higher than this when you look at other you know, research sectors that are not factored in into the bigger reports by the OECD or by the other, sorry, by the other bigger <laughs> players. I have the examples of Zambia, Nigeria, and Zimbabwe here. And I think, I'm Zimbabwean myself, so you know that in Zimbabwe, I mean, one time they say 15 billion went missing, the papers say 12 billion researchers, you know, every day, and other researchers are coming up with different figures in different, you know, extractive, um, in, in different mineral sectors, you know. This might just be maybe the diamonds, but then what about the other, what, is, what about platinum? What about the other areas? So it's really way bigger than it is. And one thing I think we need to do as researchers is to just put this big picture together, if possible at all. Now, what are our state capacity challenges in, in the African region? And I, I think this you find from Cape to Cairo, from um, Gambia or Senegal to Dar es Salaam or Zanzibar. We African countries struggle with extractive capacity itself. I don't mean extractive as in mining, for instance, in this case, or extracting minerals from the ground, although we struggle with that, but just that capability to extract, you know, wealth like taxes, you know, 
just to have that environment functioning efficiently, effectively, we struggle to get it right. Look at the numbers that pay tax and you know the, the loopholes that exist and how these are abused. There have been many cases, especially I know the ShopRite case when we were doing the APRM review in Zambia, how you know the government would, the ShopRite would change leadership every five years, then they get new concessions and it never ends. Every five years it mutates into a new entity, still called ShopRite. Um, and so we struggle with administrative capacity and that is our biggest fault because here we unfortunately are actually very able to develop policies. However, we do not implement them most of the time. All they are implemented selectively. There's a challenge in just production and delivery of public goods and services and regulating commercial activity it's, it's, it's another minefield, just like mining. Even if you look at the informal sector, which we expect things to start as informal but grow into the formal sector, but we don't get there because of just these challenges with administrative capacity. And then we have what kills and that, us most and affects the poor, uh, zero capacity, you know, distributive, zero distributive capacity, or very small redistributive capacity in which we, we, we use different mechanisms to try and narrow the gap between the wealth and the poor, cash transfers, et cetera, et cetera. And here we sit on a gold mine that can be used, you know, in, in these redistribution efforts, but we somehow fail because if we can't extract, we can't administrate, then you definitely can't distribute. We have lo low capacities to control and encourage or push for compliant behavior, especially from the mining sector. Uh, the, even the oil extractive sector as well, just the overall extractive sector. I think even in other sectors, not just this one. There is a major challenge in uh, enforcing compliance with tax policies. Everybody who has major investments here they are so well in, you know, informed on the loopholes in each country. And I know for certain, and you all know too, that in most of the countries, I mean, minerals, the president is the, president is the custodian of the mineral wealth in the country, and a lot of the big concessions are signed off by the president. You can sign off on the call, the investment center, and the other stuff, but the things that really matter, that would change the quality of lives, that would change the, you know, the quality of development you know, that, that we say is rising, you know, a lot of the time it's signed by the president. This I know for a fact because when you ask, um, if you go to the investment centers, you know, the one-stop uh, shop investment centers in many of the countries, can you see um, the information on and, uh, the, uh, the rights, everything, all the, the paperwork done for instance, <coughs> this platinum uh, venture going on here, Oh no, that one, we don't have it here. It's kept, it's signed by the president. Therefore, you'll never find that information in there. And remember, we already struggle with capacity to know how much we even have underground in terms of the platinum wealth or the gold or any other mineral, you name it. We will mine until it's exhausted, but we don't really know how much is there. And so it becomes difficult to know how much even the president has signed off because there isn't that transparency. This, this um, secrecy veil that surrounds the, the, you know, the granting of these rights and licenses is problematic. And again, when they are there, they also don't behave because they know you don't know, you know what the whole process involves, the entire uh, value mineral chain, you know, it's that specific mineral. They all have different chains. So it's, import, it's, it's possible for them to, ex, to explore, uh, explore permanently. We are doing exploration 10 years later, 15 years later. We have had examples of companies perpetually exploring, and yet they're actually mining and removing uh, the wealth without the knowledge of officials trained in it to be, you know, over, um, exercising oversight in those um, processes. Again, we struggle with our governments, with our government struggle to manage the huge cash resource inflows that sometimes just overwhelm 
um, our treasury departments. Like for instance, imagine the, the, the mineral wealth in Zimbabwe, the diamonds, just that amount of money coming into the coffers, you have no plans for it, or you have um, 20 year development plans that are disconnected from the five year development plans, disconnected from the annual budget, mm -hmm. and then you have this massive income coming in. It, it becomes very difficult. Sometimes it's just that failure to just be organized to manage such um, huge inflows. Mobilizing revenue, I've already said that's a big challenge, a very narrow tax base. Capacity to, to provide public service, this one is always puzzled me. I have just never understood what the problem is because a lot of the things are easy to provide, you know. It's, it's really just being organized. It's about the work ethos. It's about um, public servants who have enthusiasm and zeal for their jobs and know the, the meaning of government and a public that also knows what government is because you find a lot of the time in Africa the government is there, we are here. So the government has done this and leadership says the government will do this, has done this. The people don't even realize that they are the government. They should make them do this. They should ask them why they're not doing this. They should make them accountable for everything. So that that distance has remained, that there's the government on one side and there is the public on the other side. We have extremely highly centralized regulatory processes. It doesn't matter even if you say the district administrators are responsible for um, this extraction in this area. It's you know, they may just be the people you see physically to take you to your physical location, but the decisions, everything else happens elsewhere, not even in a, provinci in a provincial office, but at the central level, not even at the one-stop investment center, but many times at state house. Um, this points to all the overall lack of political will, but the sad part and the disappointing thing is that there is just overall weak institutional capacity and here referring to, to staffing and any other resources that you may need to be able to say, okay, there is some capacity. We can be proactive, we can be reactive in case of disasters. Now, what then are the predominant forms of corruption that we find in the extractive industry? People have many terms. There are many terms that are coined to define the types of corruption. Some like to call it petty, which I'm calling incidental here, but there's nothing petty about it because this is what affects the ordinary person, that guy, the majority at the bottom of the ladder here. They are affected by this incidental corruption. And when it comes to mining, you find that this is very prevalent with where small, small scale operators are present. Usually when people, artisanal miners for instance, if you look at the chain you know, that they go through, from the extraction itself, then they go, normally they take the, the ore to be crushed elsewhere, There's a, the, the chain gets longer, then it's cleaned up elsewhere, sometimes not by the artisanal miners or by the family itself, and then they have the middlemen. I know for a fact that in countries where I've done research on um, natural resource governance, there is actually quite a number of identifiable nationalities that are working as middlemen with regard to the marketing, you know, and controlling and pointing out where these artisanal miners can go and sometimes arming them as well so that they can provide what they need. And a lot of this happens in collusion with administrators and with the police in particular. There is a place in Zimbabwe where people would actually point out that all the policemen here, I mean, they are the guys in charge. So before, say for instance, this Lebanese trader comes in, you have your policeman there first to take out his cut and then, you know, the hierarchy and the chain goes up. At the end of the day, this guy continues to scramble and to destroy the environment because he's not even making anything, you know, that can make him upscale the operations or change his way. Uh, of uh, extracting um, that mineral. We have had a problem in all African countries, those with um, resources that are easy to extract, such as gold. We have f Chinese investors that um, have come in at the very local level, competing with the local artisanal miners, and they bring in equally uh, localized machinery, you know, more sophisticated, of course, than the biblical tools used by the artisanal miners. 
they bring in you know a lot of these machines that you can grind by hand where there's no electricity in the rural areas but they enable them to work at a much faster pace and exhaust resources you know when compared to the pace at which artisanal miners would work and so it leaves the whole area very chaotic and remember it's a very highly criminalized area the you know the artisanal mining sector it's a chaotic area and the Chinese have caused more chaos because they have also infiltrated the local leadership, the traditional leaders, you know, in those areas where they do the extraction. And therefore the impact of, you know, the incidental crime is very high and quite direct on local poor vulnerable communities. Systematic corruption. This is usually the large sophisticated um, corporations where they deal with high level officials, very organized, um, it's, the, 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 it's easy, the chains, it's connected people, it's, it's, things happen according to some system. It's, um, it just doesn't happen coincidentally or incidentally. It's well organized, well planned in advance, and it comes along with large capital illicit transactions. You know, It brings large capital on its own for the investment. But when you look at the illicit transactions, the outflows, they outweigh what they would have brought in. There is the abuse of market regulations because you can go and plead for this and that excuse and get that signed off. There is blatant corporate and individual tax abuse. The impact on the nation is quite direct. It is also high on communities as well. And at the national level, it's also high. But you find when it gets to the communities, it is a bit indirect because here, this is at that level where you expect the system to kick in and you are mobilizing and extracting at a national level and you are administering it so that you can redistribute it. So it has an indirect impact, nevertheless a negative impact on the local communities. And then there is systemic corruption which engulfs the entire governance system where everybody has fraudulent tendencies, just like everybody, I think, has criminal tendencies in such a system. There is um, constant blatant manipulation of legal and regulatory systems. You know, Rent-seeking behavior you know, dominates such um, corrupt systems. And here, you know, the impact on development on the public, on ordinary citizens is very high on the entire nation. At a national level, you know, it, it, country just, you know, stagnates, you know, it stops moving forward. It slides back. It just doesn't stop. It regresses. And so it is very high impact. And now you find that in a lot of these countries, you have a combination of all three forms of corruption. So you can imagine the impact then. Because when you look at your um, scorings on wealth index or you, human development index, just try and relate that and see if it is possible to look at the types of, uh, of corruption prevalent in each country and check the direct relationship with the levels of development or of non-development. And this happens because all the key conditions, the key determinant factors, you know, that determine corruption in the extractive industry are present in pretty much most African countries. We have at the center here, our corruption here, being fed by discretion to begin, to begin with. We have bureaucrats who exercise discretion. There is ministerial discretion, presidential discretion. Everybody has discretion, and everybody tweaks the rules when it passes through them. And therefore, it's very easy to, you know, to plunder resources when there's such high level of discretion. And this you can see in the amount of legislation that exists in many countries with regard to m the mining sector. Also, we have monopolies. We have the whole, say the president has the monopoly on mineral wealth in the country. That's dangerous and this is prevalent in many countries as well. And then we have a challenge of lack of accountability. A leadership, you know, investors, people who just are not accountable for their actions, for what they produce. They don't see the public. At the same time, a citizenry that has largely 
never been really able to demand accountability on them. And here you find we have the major problems that occur in the extractive sector. Capital flights, illicit movements of capital you know, across nations, misinvoicing, transfer pricing, the usual issues that, we have, uh, that our corporates have been blamed of. There are many more than this, just doing what we can manage within the 25 minutes Garib gave me. But when you look now at the an entire extractive exercise, you know, you look at the entire mining value chain, each, you know, part of the chain, each link, it has its, you know, own types of sophistication. It, de it demands certain kinds of skills that do not necessarily apply to the next level. And this is where we fail the most. For instance, that decision itself to extract some mineral. Remember, many, many countries do not have a registry. They do not record what they have where. It's unknown. But by the way, if you talk to people who are like their 80s now, um, they will tell you in, in one country where I did research, they told me that in this province, every place where you get to where you find the jacaranda tree, it denotes um, you know, gold deposits there. So these guys were the guys who did the actual mining, so they knew because the bosses told them. But they themselves have also set on that knowledge and that information. And the government has never really bothered as well, I mean, to keep track or maps or records of what is where. But these old men, they will tell you, you know, that, that that one there, there the, is the, their the gold deposits. Because when we worked with Bas Kutsi or with Bas so and so, they, they know exactly, you know, where they are. So there are markers, but we've just not been able to put things together. But the problem is that decision itself you know, the very first step in this uh, mining value chain, it's very often, you know, messed with, you know, because there are many other investors. Some are willing to pay price, some are willing to have it done differently, some incorporate you. For instance, look at a system, we need transformation, yes. But if we are saying you get 51% and this, and you know what's the point of getting any who has nothing, you need somebody with that clout. I mean, who can get things done? Who can make you dodge bullets in your company? So naturally people go for the same people over and over again, which is why we go into politics, nothing, and end up with 55 million um, rands or dollars amount of wealth because I have a useful position, not skills, it's just the position that that's, you know, is useful for man uh, maneuvering through the political system. So that maneuvering capacity is essential in this mining value chain. Oops, sorry. We have a challenge in securing informed consent in the communities. This doesn't happen a lot of the time. Local authorities make those decisions, usually on their own, and normally it's a, it's a, it's a decision made, signed off already, so there's nothing to consult on. They just come and start mining. Or if they are given some money, it's very little money to keep, keep them quiet. The legal framework for exploration and, and extraction itself, this of course calls for the right skills, which we do not have in many of the instances. And when this legislation is drafted, a lot of the time you find that in the case of African countries, it is often led by those lobbying for preferable and better you know, uh, terms than what would benefit the countries. The contracts, I mean, tax avoidance is written into the contracts from the very beginning. Extraction, because you can stand there and work there, but you have no idea what is in one ton, one ton of ore, of platinum, you all of gold? You don't know how much will actually be extracted, you know, from there, and you also don't know the deposits. So that's a major loss from the beginning because the expertise to make those detections just doesn't exist, and also procurement procedures are rarely specified, so that investors often tend to bring, you know, you know, their own equipment and do not adhere to the uh, local procedures. No social compensation ever taken into consideration. Exporting the major loophole here, because this goes hand in hand with the extracted volumes. 
taxes and royalties, there's never any transparency. It's very rare. Only when maybe a community gets um, some money, um, is a um, communal ownership or communal share, community share, etc. But otherwise, it's not transparent. And the revenue that is used in any case, there isn't that much transparency. No. So, what are the essential indicators that we would need here to deal with this easily? I'll go quickly. I think we need to have transparency, as has been said by many others. We need accountability, and we need participation. The interplay of these factors is crucial for enhancing um, better um, extractive uh, policies and practices. By transparency here, there are various types of it. We need economic transparency, institutional transparency, which is our biggest problem here because that is connected directly to political transparency. Our institutions, be they public, they are usually very much politicized. So that's quite a bit of a challenge to navigate. In the participation metrics, you know, participation is, it has many levels, many faces, from least to most. And this is from information to partnerships. Any model works depending on the value chain link that you are looking at. The value add of participation, we are already all very familiar with it, but the most important thing is that it mobilizes public support for policy decisions. You get external expert advice and analysis, therefore you minimize conflicts and delays. And it also creates room for um, independent oversight mechanisms to operate. Accountability, think of it in terms of both vertical and horizontal accountability, where you have your public institutions here, you know, being vertically accountable to each other, just like we have, for instance, with our chapter nine institutions here, but then it should take a rise with the citizens at the top where these public institutions are ultimately accountable to. And so, that accountability matrix is also very important in the extractive industry. Now, I'm not going to go through all these, but there are many, way too many international initiatives on enhancing um, efficiency, effectiveness, equality, etc., in the extractive sector. Everybody is familiar with the Kimberley process, but it has its own weaknesses as well because it doesn't really succeed in stopping the leakages in the, in the trade of conflict diamonds. Publish what you pay. It's actually a very inclusive, uh, you know, many CSOs in it, very inclusive uh, mechanism, has a lot of potential, but its emphasis, its weakness, it's just emphasizing uh, fiscal transparency. It doesn't go where it matters, where the contractual transparency is, and that's where our biggest challenge is. The World Bank has its own initiative. Again, its impact is very minimal because it's very technical oriented for capacity development and advisory services. It sounds like it's a very, it's a very superficial level. Um, the EITI, with um, over two thirds of the members being African countries, good initiative, but it's also having a low impact because it's focusing on flows between the government and companies and leaving out inter-company and intra-company. So the levels at which an initiative focuses is also important, you know, which is why I was saying it's important to have connectivity amongst these initiatives so that then the initiatives can be enriched. Whether it's a major, impressive network that emerges at the, that emerges at the end, but it is important to have that connectivity and that communication between it amongst these many initiatives. There are many more that I have listed below there. In Africa, one that seems to be promising, that could go a long way, if it moves at a faster pace, is the African Tax Administration Forum recently formed five years ago, which has also its own weaknesses. It's, about, it's working on strengthening um, uh, tax management in the region, but still it lacks you know, those instruments that would make it possible for them to exchange information so that countries don't go about, you know, um, creating blueprints over and over again. They would simply, you know, 
you know, share best practices and utilize those, but that's hard. It's like sharing information on, on crime in the region or the asset um, recovery here. If they want somebody in Zambia, it's a very political process to go through this. The president maybe has to say, yes, so and so can be arrested. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a very complicated process. There's poor communication. And the funny thing is with this, uh, out of, it's, in, it has many, African countries, but there are no like designated persons to say Gareth is the one in charge of the Zimbabwe component. He will handle all the communication just so you begin to build, you know, a base information and, and connections. And so and so is doing it in Tanzania. So there are no competent authorities, you know, who lead in this process or even participate in the process of sharing information. They do not have much legislation. They are still in the formative stage, so let's hope they are drafting something. Um, there is also some limited participation by these ATAF members in the global forums, and yet our idea is not to really you know, start new things, but make use of what works, contextualize it, indigenize it, so that we, it works for us. Africa has tried many, it has its own initiatives, you know. The African Union has what I call its own architecture on anti-corruption and mining. It has an architecture on anti-corruption, but on mining it has sort of begun to go into that with the articulation of the African mining vision in 2007. Now here we have the, the two main, you know, top institutions would be the African, the African Union's Advisory Board on Corruption which is aptly named because I thought it should be advisory board on anti-corruption, but it's advisory board on corruption, which has really struggled um, up to last year. It wasn't really functioning as had been envisaged in the beginning. So maybe it was um, just um, the symbolism fighting corruption. It's a very symbolic gesture to have that out there, but what, then what does it do? And then the African mining vision which emphasizes, of course, the extraction of mineral wealth for the citizens. But these two don't even speak to each other. They are very disconnected. Because even when you look at the national level, when the government does its plans with regarding to uh, resource mobilization, etc., they don't connect it to this. The African mining vision is articulated separately on its own. And in many ways, it is being used for political mileage, for mobilizing you know, support for elections. Um, okay, I've spoken on the African Tax Administration. Then the African Tax Administration uh, unit that I spoke of earlier has also led to some two institutions which also seem to be very promising. The last two there, the Collaborative African Budget Reform Initiative, which based here Cabri, which is doing quite a lot of work in building capacity, you know, on. Um, uh, fiscal management overall, not just tax. And then also the African Organization for Supreme Audit Institutions. We just need to know whether these auditors are qualified auditors to audit ex the extractive sector because you need different skills from your ordinary auditing processes. And you need to break them down so that they match each of the links in the value chain. There's also been the use of champions by the African Union and the two most outstanding are uh, President Buhari when he came into Nigeria and his drive against corruption, and of course, pres former President Tabombeki and uh, his um, leadership of the illicit financial flows studies and work in Africa. There's also the African Parliamentary Network Against Corruption, APNAC. They have started to learn a lot and request support in uh, understanding the extractive sector but um, they don't seem to be making much impact. APRM has tried to cater for this, you know, in the corporate sector review section of their reports. There are many other sub-regional initiatives. We have the Southern Africa Resource Barometer, started by OSISA, I think. We have the SADAC, um, SADAC Parliamentary Forum. It also is trying to exercise oversight on this issue. The International Conf Conference of the Great Lakes Region has also signed up its own initiative, regional initiative against the illegal exploitation of natural resources, but I don't see how this one works because the worst kinds of exploitation occur in that region. SAFAC and the business against corruption, action against corruption in Southern Africa are also quite active. 
at the national level, I, there are way too many. You'd have to go to each country and identify you know, initiatives there, most of them being driven by CSOs and by some other champions. We have the Center for Natural Resource Governance in Zimbabwe, which has done a lot of work, especially with raising um, awareness on the Marange diamonds. And we have the Civil Society Action Against Corruption in Malawi, which also relies a lot on external support. So this is the last slide. What then needs to be done? Like I said, the first two things that we need are connectivity and we need communication between and amongst all these entities. And at the institutional level where our capacity is problematic, I think that's where we need to focus attention. We can do a lot with regard to CSOs, and they already know their game, and they know how to exercise oversight. They even have monitoring capacity. They know how to evaluate. They know how to do scorecards. They have a lot of skills. They just don't get a chance to do it. In any case, a lot of these um, sectors are, very, are heavily fenced off, you know, they are barricaded, so it's not easy to get information. So this paper is suggesting that we need to develop capacity in the auditors in our region to identify the gaps and opportunities for fraud that occur in the extractive sector. And for them to learn in particular, to be able to identify and, you know, to trace that gap look at that difference between the imports versus exports along the mining value chain. Not just say at the end of it, the diamond mining, it were imports were, exports were. Track the entire chain and see what is happening, where exactly, where are the leakages, where do you plug in. We need capacity to monitor the extracted minerals and verify quantities for export. This is a very technical space, you know, and it means going back to the drawing board. Uh, there are some companies that have had seconded um, experts from overseas coming to help with that. But uh, somehow, at the end of the day, they leave without passing on that knowledge, or whether they leave without people absorbing the knowledge, I'm not too sure what happens. But the, that tendency to rely on the external support remains, because you find quite a number of the companies and governments' reports on a sector are prepared by the investor themselves, which doesn't make any sense. Um, there's also a need to publicize whatever amount is extracted so that the public knows and people know and keep their eye on what is being taken out of the ground and the value that is being generated by that wealth. Then a biggest challenge for us is building capacity in the law enforcement institutions from the prosecution and other oversight bodies and regulatory institutions such as the Judicial Complaints Authority Ombudsman and the, even the judiciary itself. Just capacity that is directly related to the extractive sector and its sophisticated mechanisms because some of the things you need to detect technically and I think not many would have that competence. Increasing compli compliance through independent monitoring institutions, we already have a lot of these, but they are disconnected, a lot of them. And even in, within governments, you know, our financial intelligence units, the anti-fraud agencies, but agencies, all of them are not connected to a large extent. They will share information when they need to, but they are not, it's, it's not a practice to be constantly connected. Maybe with the advent of terrorism, things will get better and people will become more connected or be forced to, but they are um, very disconnected. Again, CSOs are already doing this, but they need to increase their capacity to monitor the adherence of the African governments to regional anti-corruption mechanisms, whether they devise their own national scale or whatever mechanism, but it is important to constantly weigh this against the benchmarks. Um, supporting natural and regional anti-corruption agencies, that comes, you know, naturally, I guess, I hope. And that CSOs and the leadership in these organizations have the requisite management principles. I think recently there's a country that has been struggling with whether the anti-corruption agency has the power to issue an arrest warrant or even to take a matter up for prosecution. So there are, lots of, there are lots of issues that are not tied together in these processes. Um, and then also linking the national relevant legislative committees with CSOs. They need to, to connect so that they can 
get capacity and information on what happens in the extractive sector and what it is that these MPs in particular should look out for. Journalists can do us a favor uh, and report on the extractive sector. They just don't seem to focus on it as much as they do on other things that are just as corrupt or even worse. Um, supporting SCSOs all over to just push for some legislation to, to enforce transparency, such as the Freedom of Information Act, which have proved to be quite useful in the countries where they exist. And lastly, this is something that has already started, the establishment of uh, extractive sector liars and desks at the risks, at the risks, sorry, regional economic communities. Now they have established um, liars and desks for conflict management, not for resource conflict um, oversight, so that these initiatives all get connected and that they share information. Sorry for taking long, but I'm a teacher. I talk all the time. That's my job. Thank you for listening to me. Uh, thank you very much, Annie, for that comprehensive overview of the challenge and some of the initiatives to try and improve tackling the problem of uh, corruption in the extractive industry in Africa. Um, as I mentioned, I'll be talking mainly about how corruption is a threat to public safety and democracy in South Africa. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on the cost of corruption to Africa. I think that's been covered quite well there. We know that it really undermines development and politi political, social and economic development. Um, and that we don't really have the true extent of the corruption because all parties involved are usually committing a crime and nobody really wants to report it. Um, but we do know it's not a victimless crime, that it has very real consequences for African people. Um, and some of the research from Oxfam and other organizations in recent years have shown, uh, for example, that the annual loss of African tax revenues every year to corruption would pay for the health care that could save the lives of as many as four million children on the continent every year. Um, that there's a direct level of corruption, uh, so the ability of a, a country to develop and levels of corruption in that country. Um, that corruption and bribery particularly is associated with higher mortality, the paternal mortality rates and more children dying under the age of five. Um, as well as access to education and a range of other basic services. So we know that it's, a, it's not a victimless crime. Um, it really has very real impacts. And I'm going to talk a bit now just about the impact it's had on the criminal justice system in South Africa. Um, according to the Statistics South Africa Victims of Crime Survey, which is now undertaken annually, 77% um, of households, a representative sample consisting of 30,000 households from all parts of South Africa, believe that corruption has gotten worse or has increased in the last three years, or the three-year period between 2013 and 2016. And that's based on the experiences, not just their perceptions, the experiences of actually being asked for bribery to get access to a public service. Uh, only 12.5% thought it hadn't changed, and only 10% thought it had changed. Um, and we know from research undertaken by the Pew Research Center in 2016 uh, that Africans do find corruption as a significant social and political challenge facing their countries with 84% of South Africans thinking so, 88% of Nigerians, and 91% of Kenyans saying they thought that corruption is an important concern. The Victims of Crime Survey showed that in South Africa that, interestingly enough, the highest experience of corruption was those people who wanted to get employment in the public sector. In order to get a job in a government department, they have to pay a bribe to somebody to be able to get their foot into the door. Um, and that was 2,500 households reported having been asked to pay money to get a job, followed by people experiencing police corruptions, being asked for bribe from policing, traffic fines, third, accessing social grants, then housing, then driver's licenses and ID and passports. So this just shows, and this is not necessarily even considered the actual extent. Many people may have paid bribes and not be willing to tell a researcher that they were engaging in bribery. Um, so this is probably a relatively conservative set of numbers. Um, from Corruption Watch, their reporting mechanisms show that most of the corruption that comes to their attention is a collaboration between public officials and private people or companies. 
So there's a notion that it's only one sector or it's public sector versus private sector is a misnomer. It really is usually a combination of the two. However, from our perspective, is that you cannot get on top of corruption in the private sector unless you get on corruption in the public sector and particularly the criminal justice system. Um, because it is the state's responsibility to uphold the laws of the land, to make sure there's capacity to hold people accountable for breaking those laws, and for ensuring that wealth is fairly and equitably distributed. And if the public system that's designed for those mandates is corrupted, you're not going to get corruption in the public se private sector sorted out. So we tend to, with the ISS, and certainly our program, focus primarily on the criminal justice system and public sector corruption. And Corruption Watch just shows that most of the reports that they get are of requests for bribes, followed by embezzlement or theft of public resources, irregularities in procurement, and then irregularities in um, employment. So just onto the key impact of public, for public safety, uh, what has the, public, uh, the impact of cap state capture been for public safety in South Africa? Well, just to sort of give a, a sense that the budget for the South African Police Service has increased by 50% over the last six years. It's currently standing at around 87 billion rand. Um, and that is quite a big increase. That's above, well above inflation increase. So we know that the resources that the South African Police Service have in terms of the numbers of personnel is just shy of 195,000 people in the South African Police Service. The technology that they have at their disposal um, and proven experience in the past where they've actually focused their energies and managed to bring crime down in particular areas or in provinces shows that the, the police themselves do not lack the resources or the capacity or the experience to get on top of our violent crime problem. And in fact, for most of the democracy have been doing quite a good job. Similarly, our National Prosecuting Authority is able to prosecute difficult cases. We've seen very complex cases being prosecuted to do with corruption, fraud, involving people you no know, less than the former National Commissioner of Police, as so Jackie Salebi. So the experience and the ability and the laws are there. But why has this not been the reality in South Africa? Um, and this is where we start looking at the issue of state capture really started long before what we've seen has been happening around the state and enterprises and boards of those enterprises in more recent years. It started quite soon after Jacob Zuma emerged as the president of South Africa in 2009. In fact, the roots were sown before that with Thabo Mbeki when he fired Vusi Pakoli as the National Director for Public Prosecutions because he wanted to arrest Jackie Salebi and prosecute him. Um, and he also appointed Jackie Salebi because he believed Jackie Salebi would be personally loyal to him. But since the uh, uh, rise of Jacob Zuma to the presidency, we've seen quite unprecedented turmoil across most of our intelligence and criminal justice system agencies. Um, this slide just gives one or two examples, but it is much more uh, deeper and problematic than this. For example, in the last uh, six years, we've had, or, uh, yeah, pretty much during the last eight years, we've had at least five different people hold the post of National Commission of Police. And that post, when you're appointed, you should be there for at least five years with an option to be renewed for another five years. Um, and the reason why that's important is because when you have a large organization like the South African Police Service, the person in charge, the National Commission of Police, has the most power and ability to rally and garner the various resources the police have to strategically get on top of crime. And it's a very complex organization with different kinds of components to it. So you need a person who has authority, legitimacy, experience, understands organization, and knows how to bring together the different functions together, crime intelligence, detectives, visible policing, supply chain management, the proper procurement, so that, that, that capacity is brought to bear directly on crime. When you have a situation where you appoint people who end up being convicted for corruption or suspended or fired because they're not found fit and you keep on having new appointments, it causes a huge amount of chaos. Um, and we've seen this in the police, we've seen this in the Hawks, and we've seen this in the National Prosecuting Authority. Just to show you some of the indicators that you track, this is a the performance of the Hawks between 2010 and 2011 and 2015. The top graph shows you that in 2010-11, they made 14,793 arrests, result, and in that year also managed to obtain 7,037 convictions for high levels of or for, or crimes related to corruption and organized crime. That's where they focus most of their work. 
But as of 2014 and 15, this had dropped to 5,847 arrests and just over 1,000 convictions. Now, the number of, the, the, once again, the resources haven't declined, but the ability of the hawks to get on top of a corruption problem has clearly declined, and it's been directly related to the pressures placed on the leadership of that institution and the appointment of Berning and Temeza, despite two separate High Court rulings, findings that he was a man of dishonesty and dishonor. These, this slide just shows um, the performance of the criminal justice system in applying two very important pieces of legislation. The top graph shows you the performance in relation to the Prevention of Organized Crime Act. And we can see that last year, only 13 cases were opened, only 10 arrests were made, and only four convictions received in a piece of legislation that was passed by Parliament to make it easier for the state to tackle organized crime. So, of course, if you're running a syndicate in South Africa, this situation is not going to cause you much loss of sleep or concern. The chance of being convicted under this legislation is very low indeed. The below graph shows the performance in relation to the Prevention of and Combating of Corruption Act. Once again, the state doesn't have to prove that actual corruption took place, this, that there was just intention to be corrupt. Uh, we saw in the Sunday Times recently, this week, last past weekend, that a mining company or, or a company was claimed to have paid Colin Maini, the head of the ANC Youth League, 500,000 rand donation to the ANC Youth League in order to make its problems uh, with ESCOM go away. And Colin Maini says he denies this, and he says that he had no claim over ESCOM. This act allows him to be prosecuted for corruption even if he, gave, even if he promised something he couldn't achieve. You don't have to necessarily be able to deliver on the request for bribery. You just have to accept or be willing to accept a bribe. You don't even have to have actually accepted the bribe. You just have to have been willing to accept a bribe, even if you didn't receive it or couldn't do anything about it. The mere fact that you wanted to be corrupt can get you uh, criminally prosecuted and convicted of corruption in South Africa. But as you can see here, 58 cases opened last year, 21 arrests and 11 convictions. So our criminal justice agency is not using this legislation. I'm going to quickly go through the next few slides, but you'll just see generally in most fun functions of policing quite a notable decline in performance um, in the last five years. The top graph is just the crime threat analysis report from crime intelligence that's supposed to direct the resources of clusters and of stations and police stations towards tackling criminals in those communities. And you can see that's dropped quite considerably from 87,000 such reports in 2012. 13 to 39,000 last year, so pretty much a, a decline um, over 50%. And the network operations is, just an, is the kind of operation that do to intercept uh, communications and identify criminal networks. People are working in concert to commit crime, and you can see a big decline um, over the last two years in the numbers of operations targeting criminal syndicates. That capacity hasn't declined. There's still, uh, last year, as of about 9,000 crime intelligence officers and the South African Police Service with a budget of three and a half billion rand. That capacity is just being misused allegedly for political purposes and not for criminal purposes. This is verbal policing. We see big reductions in roadblocks, cordon and search operations, um, detective rates, the proportion of cases that the open to the police which the detectives are able to uh, solve, which means that they have some idea of who whether a crime was committed and who have committed the crime. It doesn't necessarily mean they arrest a person. And that dropping quite considerably for all violent crime and notably for robbery and murder over the last few years. And of course, behavior of the police declining as an indicated by the payouts after courts have found police have committed uh, acts of ill discipline or broken the law. So last year, the police were forced to pay out almost 300 million rand to victims of police misconduct and illegal, illegal actions, which is a 175% increase in five years. And then overall, the system, you can see that with this increase in the budget uh, for policing, they've been increasing their police numbers, and there's a large result in more arrests. Um, except for the last few years, we've started to see a decline in the number of arrests because of decline in patro uh, patrols, roadblocks, and that kind of thing. Um, and the same problem with the National Prosecuting Authority. Um, despite in the last decade, they've been 410,000 more arrests per year. There have been 23,710 fewer cases finalized by the MPA, regardless of whether they result in a conviction or not. So the system has really been under strain. It's not about 
a lack of capacity. It's not about lack of resources. It's about political interference at the top of these organizations, which has caused massive instability and an inability to use the resources we have. And this has had very real consequences for public safety. Our murder rate, that's our murder rate since the birth of democracy. And you can see that for most of the last 20 odd years, it's declined quite dramatically and quite notably. So by 20, 2012, um, the murder rate had declined by 55%, which was, and heading in the right direction. But because of all this disturbance in the last few five years, particularly we've seen this increase, and now for five years in a row, we've seen a consecutive increase of 13, 12.6, uh, almost 13%. And that works out to 3,199 more people murdered last year than was the case in 2012. Um, we're looking at 51 murders per day. So the consequence of decline in the performance of the criminal justice system because of corruption has cost us thousands of lives and made us all less safe in our homes, on our streets, driving our cars and our, our workplaces. That graph shows Aggravated robberies, which are armed attacks by armed criminal gangs usually. Um, and you can see whereas it was starting to go down from 2012 onwards, a 31% increase. So and that translates to pretty much 30 to 31,000 more armed attacks last year than was the case five years ago. Um, so it's quite substantial. Corruption not only has had an impact um, for policing in terms of improving public safety, this is a graph showing the number of cases that the police have to respond to where public violence occurs, usually a protest. The top graph just shows all kinds of policing gatherings, music concerts, uh, religious events, walk the talks, all those kind of things. The bottom graph over shows the number of events that the police have to intervene, usually using rubber bullets, tear gas, and coercive force to try and restore uh, order. And you can see quite dramatic increases. Um, last year there were 3,500 cases, and that's almost 10 instances every day. And that's a lot of those instances are community level protests, a lot of them about corruption or failure of service delivery, and it's growing because of perceived corruption and actual corruption. And of course, it's having political effects. The top graph just shows the ANC's decline in voter support in national elections, and the bottom graph shows the ANC decline in voter support for local government elections. And that brings me on to um, the issue of party political funding. The one paper that uh, is available is, was written by Judith February, and she looked into that in quite a lot of detail. Um, when we look at this internationally, it's a key issue because really what it's about is big companies, corporations, wealthy individuals who use their wealth to subvert democracy by giving donations to political parties to influence the policies that those political parties utilize or pass. Um, and that means that some people have a lot more sway in governing parties than others. The wealthier you are, the more likely you are able to ensure that your interests are looked after by the political party if there are not mechanisms in place to ensure that there is regulations around how those political parties get funded. Um, so internationally, there was a study in 2005 by the National Democratic Institute for International Affairs, and they found um, that there was a recognition by many players, we looked at 22 different countries around the world, uh, that a lot of the political corruption stems from this issue of political parties. It's how you get power in political parties and how party, political parties are funded. Because if it's funded in a corrupt way, it's sort of opaque, it doesn't have clear internal democracy, when it gets into government, it'll typically behave like that in, in the state. But little, very, little is very known about this, um, and the details of money in politics is not even known by many political parties themselves. Uh, money is raised, of course, in often from legitimate sources. Political parties need funds, and they do fundraise, and often get fundraising funds from leg legitimate sources. And that vote buying actually represents a relatively small aspect of party and candidate expenditure. It's too expensive to win national elections by buying votes, um, but you do want to make sure people vote for you, and you need money to get people to vote for you. So really. It's about political accountability. In other words, who does the party believe is accountable being sold to the highest bidder? And that legal frameworks can't solve this problem. They're necessary, but they're not sufficient. They're only partial help. So that was sort of the international uh, context in which we looked at. And of course, there's a lot of work in, uh, continentally in Africa around this. I mean, 
that's just from the African Union Convention on Preventing and Combating Corruption, has a particular focus and framework for ensuring that political parties and political financing is transparent. Uh, and their framework to say who's, you know, who, who discloses what? Is it political parties and candidates? What is disclosed? The income, the expenditure, the asset, assets and liabilities of political parties. To whom should this disclosure be made? They say to election management bodies, to a government ministry, and to the media and public. Um, and the desired results are to have better informed voters, empowered media and civil society, less political corruption, more public confidence. And we know in, that throughout Africa and most of the world, in fact, political parties or people's perception in political parties as, as a, or their trust is declining. It's certainly a, a big challenge. Um, and we've had a lot of the sort of shortcomings around the extractive industries, and some of these are quite similar for the party funding issue in, in Africa. Um, they need money to operate, but in some places uh, there aren't regulations about how they can get that money or how they should disclose who they get money from. And in some pla places the state provides no money to political parties, um, in others they do. But typically, even where there are some levels of anti-corruption frameworks and accountability, the willingness and the ability to enforce those legislations or frameworks is not uh, adequate. Of course, different socio-political context determines how this all plays out and depending on how democratic the country is or its culture of democracy. And that Africa is the continent of the lowest share of countries that require disclosure from party funding. In South Africa, our constitution requires that there is funding for political parties in order to promote uh, a multi-party democracy. And it says that national legislation must be provided um, for those parties that are participating in national and provincial legis legislatures uh, on an equitable and proportional basis. And the legislation giving expression to this was the Public, financing, Public Funding of Representative Parties Act of 1997, and it provides funding to South African political parties. So when it comes to public funding, there's no shortage of that. Um, our first democratic election cost an estimated 963 million rand in 1994 prices. Um, in 2014, the IEC itself spent 1.5 billion rand for those elections, uh, of which parties received 114 million rand for campaigning purposes. We know that the total amount from recent work done by the Treasury um, is that public that political parties in South Africa received last year one just under just over one billion rand in public money from three various four sources. One is the represented political party fund, secondly the National Assembly, and thirdly provincial legislatures. Um, Ninety percent of the fund of money is allocated to parties by their proportional representation. Another ten percent is by the number of seats they hold in the provincial legislatures based on the equity approach. So. They do get a lot of money. One billion rand is going to political parties every year in South Africa to promote political party funding. But the way it's allocated is not very equal. Out of that one billion rand, the ANC probably gets around 600 million rand. And although it's supposed to be for promoting political party operations and, and so forth, that money isn't really accounted for in a lot of detail because there's not legislation saying what it, they should be doing. Uh, this graph just briefly breaks down the top most highly supported parties, the ones with the most seats in the National Assembly and Provincial Assembly, um, from the RPPF, the Representative Political Party Fund. You can see the ANC, because of its dominance in terms of the number of seats, nationally and provincially gets the highest amount of 75, just over 75 and a half million, followed by the DA with 27 and a half million, the EFF with 10.3 million, um, and then if you, a you only get 276,000 ran because you don't have any provincial party seats, provincial legislative seats. So it's not really promoting um, smaller parties. It's largely being, most money that is distributed is largely being taken up by the larger parties. But there's no regulation for private sector funding at all. Um, and so from what's been reported on, what we know, there's quite a lot of money, additional money coming from the private sector. Uh, it's been estimated that between 94 and 2009, um, the amount that came from private funding increased from 100 million to around 550 million. In fact, the former ANC Treasurer General Matthew Sporza reported that the ANC raised 1 point, almost 1.7 billion between 2007 and 2012 alone, just in those uh, five years. In 2014 elections, the ANC reportedly spent 400 million, and in last year's local government elections, Mvula Mokanyane, who was the head of the ANC election uh, campaign, said that they spent a billion rand 
clearly you can't spend your way out of a declining support base if you're corrupt or experiencing problems of corruption. Um, and then the ANC accused the EFF of accepting funds from President Mugabe. Um, and we know, for example, there's various ex examples of this, the, the uh, Chancellor House, which is the ANC funding vehicle, but the Oilgate scandal was a very clear example of how 15 million rand of uh, public money was paid from Petro SA into a private account and immediately 11 million rand was transferred to the ANC to fight the 2004 elections. So that's a clear case of where party f uh, public private funding can cause corruption in the state. Fortunately, there's a new bill in place. The ANC has recognized that there are signatories to the ANC AU conventions, um, and it's, I'm not going to go through a lot of detail, but really what it does is provide a lot more focus on how, if this gets passed into law, it will show, it will really const constrain and improve transparency on private political funding. So it sets up a multi-party democracy fund so that private sector companies can give to the fund which is administered by the Electoral Commission, and that Electoral Commission then can take those donations to parties based on a formula that they will agree to. So that means big banks, big corporations don't have to give each political party a, a certain amount, they can just give it to the fund and allow the IEC to report on that and, and who got what. Um, but it also ensures that even political parties themselves uh, have to, by law, disclose who they get money for, from how much they get money, uh, what, how much of it is, and also constrains where they can get money from. Um, so they may not receive funding, for example, from any organ of state, foreign governments or foreign government agencies. They can receive foreign entities, uh, money from foreign entities or persons if it's for skills development, training, or policy development, but not for campaigning and other purposes. Um, they can't receive money from state-owned enterprises or the National Lottery Fund, or if the money they receive is reasonably suspected to have been the proceedings of crime. So that is the first time that there will be, if this becomes law, very clear legal parameters on what private, uh, what, what can be presented to or given to par political parties. Um, and then it says that the funds from the multi-party democracy fund must be used to promote the political will of the people. I'm not going to go into all this lot of detail. We are running out of time. Um, and how it must be used. And, but there are some shortcomings in the bill in that it doesn't say what the cap on expenditure should be. Um, in other words, to try and contain excessive political party campaigning funding and what the cap on donations could be. And also it doesn't say what the threshold for disclosure is. It says that there should be a, def a defined threshold upon above which you must disclose, but that threshold doesn't exist. So it'll be up for the political parties um, and the uh, Independent Collect Electoral Commission to decide. But there's quite a lot of there on enforcement. So ultimately, the Electoral Commission can do investigations, receive complaints, or ask for audit of, uh, audits of the fund, make sure that the, each political party sets up a bank account and has an accounting officer in this party that all private donations must go to, must be disclosed. So if this, part, if this goes forward, it will change the uh, funding environment in South Africa. But there's always ways to get around these things. And as I said, it's not just about the law, it's about the, it's about the political culture, it's about the role of civil society, the judiciary, the media. Um, and that's why we say that it's something that civil society, NGOs such as ourselves and others must play an active role to track this and to make sure that we know as much about who's funding our political parties as possible so that they are not used by powerful interests against the interests of all South Africans. So I'll end there and I'll invite Diesel to come over and do the last presentation before we open for a few comments. Thanks, Gareth. I must start off with congratulating Professor Chekwana Ani for, that fan for a fantastic report. I think the African Union should uh, use it as a tool for its anti-corruption campaign next year. It really is, I would recommend, for worth reading. Um, so I'm going to just very generally make a few introductory uh, remarks and then basically look at the African Union's initiatives um, and also a couple of examples of how what we've seen now in the last couple of months where corruption, grand, grand corruption has been exposed. Of course, we know it takes a lot of political will to get this done, um, and there are a few examples, positive examples, on the continent, um, but many drawbacks as well. Um, I thought just to start off with to look at uh, a couple of definitions from Corruption Watch. 
Um, corruption is the abuse of public resources or public power for personal gain. That comes from uh, our own partners, I think, Gareth, Corruption Watch uh, at the ISS. The UN Office on Drugs and Crime see corruption as a complex social, political, and economic phenomenon that affects all countries. And I think that's where my emphasis wants to be in this introduction as well, is that we tend to look at corruption as an African phenomenon, and we sometimes uh, forget that from Brazil to uh, South Korea to France and Italy, there is just as much corruption. Um, and also, Gareth spoke of uh, corruption not being a victimless crime. Um, there was a paper earlier um, by the, the ISS uh, director, Anton Duplessis, about terrorism. And, um, cor and he says corruption is the most neglected human rights violation of our time. Because all the studies, and there was a recent study again by the UN on people's motivation for joining uh, uh, jihadist terrorist organizations and radicalization, and many of them say it's because they've experienced corruption and they've been driven to radicalization because of that experience. So really, um, when, you, when you think generally of uh, corruption in Africa, it is like a cancer that manifests itself in many different ways, and we have to find some diagnosis and some, uh, I think, the, uh, the remedies for wherever it manifests itself, whether on a very local level or on a very high level, is going to definitely be different. Why is it so important um, for the African Union and for heads of state and for organizations of civil society to get involved in corruption in Africa? As I said, it's not because it's bigger in Africa than elsewhere. It is because of this that uh, Annie has showed us. It is, it's because of our, the riddle that we have to solve on our continent of being the richest continent in terms of natural resources, but the poverty we see around us. How is that possible? And every single speech you listen to at the African Union, heads of state are saying this, why are we such a rich continent and yet uh, so much poverty. Of course, we, we have the uh, illicit flows out of the continent from um, the um, exploitation of mineral resources, which I, I suspect, and as I'll say later on, there will be a lot of emphasis next year when we have this African Union campaign on the complicity of multinationals with uh, exploiting Africa's oil wealth and Africa's mineral wealth and uh, leading to a situation where really uh, we are on our knees and even in South Africa the latest statistic shows that 50% of 55% uh, of people I think are living in poverty really. Um, so just very quickly um, the main challenge for us now going forward, and as I said, I'm, I'm going to try and be brief. I, I, I think we could speak a lot also about the root causes of corruption on a, a more philosophical level and why in Africa the nature of the post-colonial state and the way that our indigenous institutions have been eroded, etc. But looking forward, I think, is, is what is important for us now. Um, at being at what is being done and the trends uh, on the continent. So um, basically the fight against corruption, as I said, has become a popular slogan in the African Union amongst politicians from Nairobi to Abuja and from Banjul to our parliament in Cape Town. But do they really mean it? So now we do have a commitment that the African Union has said that in 2018, um, it will be the year of winning the fight against corruption. A sustainable path to Africa's transformation. I often wonder who thinks of these very long elaborate themes <laughs> for the African Union. Um, so the question is, you know, what is this going to entail? Because generally in the past, we haven't expected much from these AU themes. They are usually uh, completely sidelined through 
a host of other co uh, conflicts and crises and so on on the continent. But one has to say that, for example, this year was called, uh, let me get it right, in um, harnessing the demographic div dividend on the continent investi through investment in the youth. That was quite a, a mouthful. And there have been many initiatives and there have been meetings and uh, the youth have been drawn into many of the AU events. For what it's worth, I think there was an effort to focus on the demographic dividend, which is, we know, the main one of the main issues on our continent going forward. Um, in 2016, um, it was announced that the year would be focusing on human rights and all of us in civil society was jump were jumping up and down uh, thinking the AU is now going to look at human rights. In the end, uh, the theme of 2016 was human rights with a focus on women's rights and there was a lot of focus on, on women's rights and we must give Nkosa Zanat Lamini Zuma credit for what she did uh, for women's rights uh, on the continent, maybe not on, on any other issues. So what can we expect uh, in this year? The African Union definitely has a plethora of instruments, networks, uh, organizations, and I think first of all the, uh, the aim would be to look at these and then to say, uh, make sure these protocols and uh, conventions are uh, ratified and adopted and most importantly uh, implemented. So the first one here is the um, the Convention on Preventing and Combating Corruption. Um, out of the 55 countries, only 37 ratifications. Uh, it's not enough, it's more than half, but we have countries like Angola, the Democratic Republic of Congo and so on here in SADC that have not ratified this. Um, and then I think uh, Annie spoke about the AU Advisory Board on Corruption, who seem based in Arusha, they seem to be doing uh, quite a lot. It's also linked to the implementation of this instrument, this convention. Um, you, the UN Economic Commission for Africa is very involved, and I'll speak a little bit uh, about that just now. Um, we also have other institutions like the Commonwealth Anti-Corruption Center that does training, uh, awareness raising, there's the African Association of Anti-Corruption Authorities, um, they work with the UN uh, Office on Drugs and Crime, there's the African Parliamentary Network, I think uh, you also spoke about that, um, they were formed in, uh, in 2003 in, in Kampala, so there are all these instruments and networks but really um, are they being ratified and are countries adhering and, uh, uh, to these instruments? In SADC, we have an important protocol that um, came, uh, was ratified uh, and um, implement, well, it's not really been implemented, but exists since 2003. It has a long list of interesting recommendations, including issues like the protection of whistleblowers, which we haven't spoken about yet, but is very important when it comes to rooting out corruption, as well as extradition of those guilty of corruption in various Sadek countries. I don't think that will apply to Grace Mugabe's extradition when she is found guilty, but uh, it's about corruption and, and in terms of fighting corruption, through that uh, extradition. Um, it's, been, it's been ratified by many countries, the SADC protocol. Um, it looks like, yes, Madagascar and the Seychelles, which just joined SADC, is not uh, yet part of that. And then we have the SADC uh, anti-corruption committee as well. Um, so the main recommendation, there is also an organization called the Anti-Corruption Trust of Southern Africa that does monitoring of the implementations of these protocols. Um, and it, it is for this, for the, the um, SADC committee to oversee the implementation that was really just founded in 2015. It must now get its work done and keep countries accountable for uh, implementing these uh, protocols that they have signed. Interestingly, 
Uh, 100% of SADC countries have ratified the UN Convention Against Corruption. Um, and almost all African states, and we, we see the same thing with funding the African Union. Uh, all member states of the AU pay their dues to the UN, and then we have 30% or so that pay to the AU. So there's this double standard that we really can't, when we're talking about African solutions for African problems, we really don't understand that. But the UN Convention Against Corruption is quite interesting, and it does oblige signatories to um, annually or biannually show the implementation and come and report back on what they've done. Um, so we've got these instruments and as I said earlier, I think oh, I, first of all we will see at the African Union if this theme is now um, implemented, a lot of focus will be on illicit flows, the Tabu Mbeki report, the $50 billion every year uh, that leaves Africa through illicit flows, uh, um, corruption in terms of taxation, etc. And that where the focus really should be about the political will of actors to implement all these protocols that they've ratified. That is really what we, what we need to see. But um, the African Union you know, always has to trade carefully because it is ultimately an organization of heads of state uh, that run the show. Um, one must also remember that in the AU, we now have a whole new team uh, uh, of decision makers equally in the UNECA, the Economic Commission for Africa. Uh, Vera Songwe is the new uh, executive director. So, and Musafaki Mahamat, that I also speak about a little later, he's from Chad, uh, has now taken over from Kosazana Dlamini Zuma. They've got a lot on their plate. They have to reform the AU. Uh, they have to look for money because it seems as if the new uh, funding plans of the AU aren't really taking off. Um, so there's a lot for the AU to do, and uh, really we would like to see um, th this anti-corruption drive really taking off. Um, maybe just a word, uh, I, I wrote a, a short piece about uh, the positives that we see and all the changes in terms of fighting corruption on a, on a continental scale. One of the things that we have seen is that the drive to rid the continent of terrorism and other issues like piracy have led to the adoption of protocols and agreements and also more activity uh, uh, in terms of fighting uh, money laundering. Um, and I've just mentioned here a few of the more continental policing uh, networks. We have the SARCO that I think the ISS has worked a lot with uh, in the past. We've got money laundering groups, asset recovery um, that countries now uh, work with. But mostly, um, what we've seen on the continent up to now, when it comes to grand corruption, as I've said, the only real way for heads of state and for public officials to be held accountable is when there is a major change of political power um, and the downside of that is, of course, that often the accusation is that this is just for political purposes. Uh, whenever there's a change of power, the one who's out of power gets accused of corruption. Interestingly, in Zambia and Malawi, that's what we've, where we've seen this the most uh, happen. Um, you'll remember in 2002, um, just get my right paper. In 2002, we had Frederick Chaluba, we also had Rupia Banda, uh, accused of corruption, uh, Bakili Mulusi in Malawi, and now uh, I, I'll look at that a little bit more in detail, Joyce Banda, the former president, uh, who only was president for two years from 2012 to 2014. She's now been accused of corruption. Um, in Senegal, for example, in 12, 2012, when Macky Sall took over as president, um, there was a huge anti-corruption drive. And the former uh, super minister who was almost running the whole show in Senegal, Karim Wad, the son of the former president, uh, Abdullah Wad, was put in prison. He was tried for massive amounts of corruption. In the end, there was a deal struck and he was uh, let free. But this kind of, um, let's say, politically driven, high profile arrests and accusations of corruption um, 
it really doesn't help us that much because there is that uh, con political connotation that it's uh, through expediency. The only one where we can really see, for example, in 2015 when Buhari came in in Nigeria, as you say, uh, uh, as you mentioned, that is when he really went on a thorough drive, uh, anti-corruption drive. But um, it still remains to be seen whether that's going to be sustainable given the weaknesses. And in some areas in Nigeria, I think um, it's more systemic corruption in the state than systematic. And it's going to take a long drive to root out corruption, just like the same here. Um, yes, so the, the Malawi's Cashgate scandal is maybe an example, um, as I said, of also these uh, high-profile, rooting out corruption. Africans are very innovative when it comes to naming our corruption scandals. We have had Cashgate, we have had Chicken Gate in Kenya. There's the Zupta Gate and the Zupta Leaks. Uh, we don't know what's going to be next, but Cash Gate, I don't know if you remember one of these civil servants in Malawi was caught with a boot of uh, cash in his car and uh, the corruption is, uh, I mean, the cash gate, uh, we're speaking of $32 million, million which is really a, a drop in the ocean, I think, uh, compared to uh, other corruption scandals. But for a tiny country like Malawi, it's a big thing. So now, basically, Joyce Banda, the former president, is again accused of corruption. There's been a warrant for her arrest. Her opponents say uh, she had nothing to do with it because she was the one who actually brought this to light in 2014. She, she, as I said, she came to power. She was um, president from 2012 to, to 2019. So um, you know, how could she be the one who is now responsible? So the whole issue of political expediency and tackling corruption for political purposes really sort of dilutes what we've, what we've now seen. Um, but it is possible when there's a change of government. Um, also, the other interesting development that we've seen to tackle this uh, top-level corruption um, is NGOs getting together, tackling uh, um, corrupt leaders who have stashed their um, monies outside the continent. And uh, Oxfam, in a report, says about 30% of Africa's wealth is outside the, the, the continent, um, which is different to what we see in places like South Korea or even Brazil or France. Um, the money tends to be plunged back into the country. There's just as much corruption, as I said, but um, it isn't stashed off, uh, offshore. So... Um, this very interesting procès de bien mal acquis, which is translated as the uh, ill-gotten gains um, court case, actually started more than 10 years ago when Amnesty International and a number of NGOs went to court and asked that the ill-gotten gains of uh, dictators in Africa and corrupt authoritarian leaders that they be attached uh, when they have these luxury apartments in Paris and yachts on the Mediterranean and luxury cars in Switzerland, in order for them, because those were ill-gotten gains, they um, are public goods. So after 10 years, we've now, for the first time in June this year, um, the son of um, uh, Theodore uh, Obiang uh, Ngema, um, of Equatorial Guinea is standing trial. Oh, a nice picture of him. He is a notorious playboy uh, on the continent. I actually had a list here of all the things that he had stolen and stashed away. Uh, luxury cars. Uh, here it is. It's in French, but um, if anybody is interested, it's, it's just phenomenal how uh, he's vice president, by the way, of Equatorial Guinea and minister of just about everything but now he is being tried um, he denies uh, these charges and says that this is his own personal money but of course yes he has yachts and a hotel uh, oh, okay not a hotel a hotel particulier which is a massive mansion in the 
uh, in Paris is Avenue Foch that is valued at 107 million euros. And um, Yves Saint Laurent art collections and I don't know how many, 18 luxury vehicles. So it's high time he stands trial. But these are high profile and they're being tackled from uh, outside of the continent. So really just to end off, um, I would just like to us to look at just this one deal because Musafaki Muhammad uh, is from Chad and he is now running this um, project. Um, and also, I think if we look at the AU, we really have to say to ourselves that there has been this authoritarian slippage and that the AU is now being run by, uh, in terms of its reforms and so on, President Paul Kagame, Idris Deby of Chad, uh, Alpha Conde of Guinea, these are not great Democrats. And, and so it's going to be a challenge for someone like Musa Faki to run this anti-corruption drive. Um, I don't know, many of you were around, maybe Gareth and I, <laughs> <laughs> in 2000, um, the big buzzword and the big symbol of uh, the drive to combat corruption in the extractive industries was this massive pipeline deal. I don't know if you remember, from Chad through to Cameroon, World Bank came on board, billions of dollars. The Chadian government signed up and said, we are going to spend 70% of the proceeds of this money for the, so many hospitals, so many healthcare centers, etc. Um, and then the whole deal fell apart quietly in 2008. Um, and it was, it was seen to be really um, such a good example of what can be done. Um, but why did it fall apart? And, and I would end off with that. Uh, President Idris Deby is not a Democrat. He, is, uh, he spent the money on the military. Uh, and that was the end of, uh, of that uh, agreement. Uh, Musa Faki Muhammad, uh, he is the foreign, former foreign minister of Chad. He's, that's him. He said on the 11th of July, which is Africa Anti-Corruption Day, that corruption is undoubtedly the most pressing governance and development challenge that Africa is confronted with today, as its debilitating and corrosive effects reverse hard-won developmental gains and threaten progress, stability, and development on the continent. So there you have it, and he is going to run the, ant the 2018 anti-corruption drive from the AU, and we wish him all the best of luck. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Liesl. Uh, that brings us to the end of the presentations and the online portion of the seminar. We will now go into some questions and discussion that are subject to Chatham House rules. So thank you to the online audience for, for watching the seminars, participating. Please contact us if you'd like copies of either of these two papers. The one is called Combating Corruption in the Extractive Industry. Another one is called Elections for Sale, Political Party Funding and Necessary Evil. Okay, so there you have it. There's been a lot of information about a lot of different components of corruption, um, ranging from what's afflicting the continent.